just going to let Andy get set up this morning. A little bit different this morning. Andy's joining us on the platform um, so that we can record the service and the signing and at the same time um, so that anyone that is watching can also follow along who is deaf. I hope one day to see Andy signing Hollyoaks. Maybe not on a Sunday morning. I'm sure that's the path he's headed on. Turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians 3, uh, and we're going to read from verse 10 together. And it begins this, and we break right into Colossians 3 this morning, stitching it against what I've spoken about in the past, the new self, putting off the old self and putting on the new self. And it says this, the writer says, And having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, here, here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ ruin your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. In recent months, we have talked about the new self, putting off the old self, and that great exchange which saw our understanding perhaps maybe somewhat incomplete, that Christ has taken our place, but we have taken his. It is like Christ going to the cross like an old jacket. We have taken it off and given it to him, and to the cross he takes it, and there it dies. But also that he is given us something to wear. His righteousness, the new self that we put on, like a new jacket. You know, as an elder in my first couple of months, it's been a privilege to, and interesting, to listen and to talk and to hear with all of you, Sunday after Sunday, tough questions that force you to reevaluate or rethink or jar you in your understanding, standing in these pews, dealing with the questions of life and being challenged. I am reminded each week of a time when I stood in these pews with a good friend and he asked me this one question and it is where we begin this morning. What are we doing here? Why are we here? And not some esoteric question about existence. What are we doing here at Westwood Hill? Specific about this place and this gathering, this body of believers, this church. What is its purpose here in East School Bride, what are we doing here? A serious question that this morning has a serious answer. Why Westwood Hill? Why this body of believers? And to answer it this morning, we begin here with Paul writing to a church in Colossae. A church Paul confesses he has never even been to, never visited, but through his preaching, indirectly has planted a church. You know, young men like Epaphras who have come to Ephesus to hear Paul preach, leave that point and go on into Asia Minor to plant more churches, one in Colossae. You know, when you read about Colossae, it has a striking resemblance to our own town, to East Kilbride. 
It's likely the same population size, a market town surrounded by agriculture. Also near to the big city of Lady Osea and Heriopolis. <laughs> so I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that it's like our town. Or the people of Colossae are like our people. Or perhaps even the church in Colossae is very much like the church here in East Bright. See, Paul's purpose is chiefly to write to these believers to correct some of their misunderstandings. You see, a heresy has arisen in this church. And although he never really states what that heresy is, it gives him an opportunity firstly to teach the believers in Colossians about the supremacy, the sufficiency and the uniqueness of Christ. But secondly, to explain the effect of the work of Christ that the Spirit of God has on a new church, that they are building a new type of community there, that those whom Christ draws to himself into that body, that new body, that new community, is like which with the world has never seen before. And it is a mystery that this vehicle, this church, is the means by which God wants to spread the gospel throughout this world. This broken group of people brought together to share the gospel. And it's in this understanding I've spent some time in the past months to explain who Jesus is in Ephesians when Paul writes. It's now I want to move on and stitch it again against this idea of a new community. The effect of who Christ is on people does something. Does something. What it's meant to be like. You see, I think there's a problem that has infected our church. A heresy, perhaps. That's subtle and it's thinking like a frog that sits in boiling water and does not jump out as the heat is slowly turned up. And the problem is this. It's the erosion of congregation. Or simply put, it's the lack of relationships in the new community. It's a strange thing that has happened to the church in the West, especially middle-class churches. They've become gathered communities, donut churches, where where people are bust in and bust out. And it has led to this separating effect between believers in a body. You see, our self-centered, self-obsessed world has elevated, more so in the church, Christian belief and experience of the individual above the body itself. Yes, it's important that Christ has done something in you. But somewhere along the line, we've forgotten the second part that this draws people together into a body together, a body of believers connected to each other in ways in which this world will never fathom. And it's this that Paul tackles in this sermon. Let's read again together. He says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, Here there is not Greek and Jew and circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Terms define us, don't they? Terms. We like terms. Our news gives us terms every day. Our positions, they polarise us. Can I ask, are you a remainer? A lever? Are you pro-independence or against Are you left? Are you right? Are you Celtic? Are you Rangers? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Christian? Are you atheist? Are you secularist? What about class? Are you upper class? Middle class? Working class? Benefit class? You know, when I was going through this and speaking to a friend and talking about class, I was trying to define how you work out what class you are. And we came down to a very simple method. It's driven from the very first question someone will ask you. Will betray your class to that person. If you're upper class, they tend to ask who you know. Now, do you know 
so and so. To define if you are part of that group. If you're middle class, you tend to do something different. You tend to ask people, now, what is it you do? What is it you do? What, what use are you to me? And perhaps even working class or even benefit class. Where are you from? Where are you from? Do I identify you from where you were born, where your location is? Are we the same? These terms make reference and allow us to make sense of the world that surrounds us. And Paul concludes in his argument, one which we are familiar of, that putting off the old self and putting on the new self, that there is a great equaliser amongst believers. And it is this. He is saying that the worldly distinctions that think define you don't define you here in this new community. They don't exist. I'm Greek. Oh, I? Well, hey, I'm Jew. Oh, I? Ah, right, okay. I circumcised. Ah, right, okay. <coughs> Uncircumcised, big man. Aye. Barbarian, mate. Mm, Scythian. Slave? No, not me, mate. I'm free. I'm free. The great equalizing truth for all believers, Paul writes, is this. is there in your text, and it says, Christ is all. Where once we boast is in our standing, our intellect, our job, our position, our wealth, our politics, our abilities, our class, now Christ is all. Unfortunately, if we were to leave it there, we'd only get half the story that Christ is all. And it's perhaps this is what concerns me about our church, that we leave the verse unfinished, incomplete, just a kind of head knowledge that Christ is all. Right, got it, big man. Thanks very much. 11 o'clock next week. I'll see you there. If in the end it's as if John Piper says, it's not enough to simply say Christ is all. If that were enough, then the rest of Colossians would not have been written. And the preacher would have no message. And there would be no place for small groups or community. Or places where people can question and struggle and ask, If Christ is all, how come my loved one died? Or when my marriage is on the rocks, where is Christ all then? Or when the darkness of mental difficulties or illness surrounds and great takes hold, how then is Christ all Or when anxieties feel like towering walls that come over you, unescapable, Christ is all. How is Christ all when I'm facing struggle and decisions just to quit, just to give up? Let's look back at verse 10. And having put on the new self, which is being renewed, which gives context to the second half of this verse, the peace that we must cling to, in its entirety is this Christ is all and in all it's this renewal of the new self this new body this new person that Christ makes us this rebirth that connects that Christ is all and in all together it is our banner across this church it is not enough to understand that Christ is all That has no power, it has no effect if we do not realise that Christ is in all. This is what gives rise to a new community, a new understanding, a new way of living which is different and distinct. And in the next verses, the writer gives an outline of those characteristics of this new self, this new community, how they have to behave and the relationships in which it will define it. And this is my earnest prayer this morning for our church as we go through these together. He starts by saying, put on then, in verse 12. Again, the writer pulling together the idea of wearing clothes, something to be put on and describing something that you wear. You know, you're purposeful in what you wear, aren't you? You get up in the morning, you put on something, you, when you go to work, go to school, go to uni, go to church. You came to church this morning, you decided to pick out your good tie. You wanted to put it on. You were purposeful in what you wore. What about being presentable for God? Were you purposeful 
each day to be presentable for God, putting on the things that he wants us to wear. Let's find out what they are. The writer continues, he says, as God's chosen ones. That is, before the beginning of time, this wonderful mystery is that, that God chose you in the same way that a family may adopt a child into their family. We are adopted into God's family. God becomes your father, Jesus your brother, and the church becomes your crazy extended family, your crazy aunts and uncles and crazy brothers and sisters. And why? Because he loved us. Paul follows on from this again. We're going to race through these together. He says, chosen and holy. He builds on this understanding of adoption, not simply just as we understand it, adoption into a new family. There's something special about this family. This is an adoption into a royal family. Can you, be, can you imagine being adopted into the royal family in the UK? Can you imagine if I was adopted into the UK? Royal family, six foot two, broad Scots accent, <laughs> towering above the Queen. Can you imagine? Or well, think about when Meghan was married into the royal family. We celebrated that last year. And she instantly became something different. There was a different expectation, a different standard to maintain. She was no longer treated like everyone else. And this is the same with our adoption. And then that in this royal family, we are now, as Paul writes, holy, not treated like anything else. You and I are not the same as the crowd, but special, sacred, and set aside. These are the virtues of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the impact that this has on the believer, but more so has on the new community and the family in which we share? To things like distinctions that we mentioned moments ago. It matters not a jot your background. Your standing, your position in Christ, all are holy. And he goes on, he writes, and beloved, that is the king of this royal family, has deep affection for his children. Affection. Ladies, most of you have no issue with understanding this term because the world is happy for you to be affectionate. So you get it like this, quicker than your counterparts. Gentlemen, if you have difficulty with the word beloved or affection, I bet you don't call your brother sitting to you right now, are right, beloved? Not for me. So understand it like this. This is the love a father has for his children. A father who says, well done, son. I love you. And why is it important that this new community that Christ draws to himself has this understanding that they are loved? Well, some of you have spent a life of separation. Some of you have never been told that. Not once. That you are loved by God. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Again, he goes back to the idea of things to wear that we live in our lives. Taking the advice of Proverbs 4 and 23, guard your heart, the wellspring of your life. The Bible speaks over again, over 900 times, about the heart and its condition. Elsewhere in the Bible, it says that the heart... Out of the heart springs deceitful desires. It is why Christ, who is all, has to take what you wear and give you something new to wear. Because your old heart is broken, corrupted and hostile to God. This new heart. Where these things spring from has new characteristics. And when you wear it, you wear them. He says, compassionate hearts. Now, what does this mean? Well, firstly, if this is you, you are considerate of others that you care for, worry about, look out for. You see others struggling and you step in to take care. And then he says, kindness. And kindness is an extension of compassion. But ultimately, there is a cost to kindness. 
It takes action to demonstrate kindness and these actions usually have a cost. And sacrifice must be made to be kind. In time and effort and emotion, to be kind to someone is costly. And in the age of the selfie, we're willing to spend it in abundance on ourselves and not others. We've become used to the me, 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 me photograph, haven't we? I'm fortunate to live between the pre-selfie age and now. Some people will and some people won't. But taking a picture cost you something, didn't it? It cost you something. I remember my wee red camera, my wee windy camera, and I had to wind it. You'd only get 28, maybe you'd get a wee bit more if you were lucky. You'd kept, kept winding just to check. A picture cost something. So you were careful about what you took. <coughs> now it costs nothing, so you take pictures of all sorts of nonsense. I always remember you'd be raging if you found a picture of your feet and your, <coughs> and your printed photographs, wouldn't you? You go, ah, that's one wasted. Now it costs us nothing. If there's one thing our world lacks, it's compassion and kindness. Not just in short bursts, not just during charity events where you text 20 quid to appease yourself. What about kindness that Christ delivers, that costs everything? What about compassion upon those who don't deserve it? The way Jesus would be kind and compassionate. He keeps going, he says, and humility. What is the opposite of humility? It's pride. This is an overinflated sense of ourself or our place. It's a sin and it is a problem. Humility simply understood is, is rightly knowing and acting in your place. Some of us are not in charge. And that's okay. Perhaps even it might be safer. But some of us behave like the master when we should be the servant. Some are full of pride and think they run the show but really they should be quiet and go on with work. I've written here, this is me, just to remind myself that this is what I deal with. Humility brings order. Why is it important to have these things for the new community? The virtue of Christ, the one whom the Bible speaks of, the one who came to be served, and sorry, the one who came to, the one that came not to be served, but to serve, simply puts, Conflict. Conflict never appears between two people who are humble. Ladder climbers, they jockey for position out in the world. They'll stand on whoever they need to to get ahead, trampling on others to gain a better seat at the table. In the new community, humility means preferring each other's needs over your own. Seeking to serve and not to be served. Ah, the worship was rubbish today. The preacher, I don't like him, he's not my cup of tea. I forgot. I forgot you were the one who was to be served. Meekness, he continues, he says, unfortunately many of us equate, equate meekness to weakness, and Jesus displays meekness, as one pastor I listen to says he displays power under control. Meekness is power under control, tough and tender. Knowing when to be one or the other. In 1971, Frank Perdue, I don't even know if you remember Frank Perdue, I don't. I wasn't born here, but I do know about him. He was an American chicken farmer and had a slogan for his Perdue chicken and it was this. It takes a tough man to make a tender chicken. <laughs> you can see the literal results of this in the lives of those who are 100% tough all the time. They will pound everything around them and tenderize it to a pulp. If we are always tough, then we're overbearing at best and destructive at worst. <coughs> or perhaps like a tender chicken. That is, we're 100% tender all the time. Then we are overrun. I've seen an advert for Frank's chickens. It's on the screen. The chicken is undoubtedly the victim. Nowhere do we see in Christ's meekness him play the victim. And he could. He could have, having real cause for unjustly and falsely accused, punished in the most severe way, he could have been the victim. 
He could have cried out to God and declared himself the victim, but throughout his last days, he displays true meekness. In the new community of the Church of Westwood Hill, we're called to be meek, that is tough for each other and tender with each other. Although Christ, who was tough, chose more often to be tender with those who came to him. He goes on, he says, impatient. Impatience. When does this sermon end? And if you may, if your mind just jumped to that clock, then this one is for you. And then you say nothing more than just stand here in silence for the next two minutes. And that's cruel and <laughs> that would be cruel and unusual punishment. Our on-demand world has eroded our patience, has it not? We can do everything now without me having to confess all my sins this morning. Again, this is another area I struggle with. If you have seen me watch another type on a keyboard, then you will know how impatient I get. And you single finger with typers out there, I know who you are. But it definitely feeds into the next point that Paul is writing about, giving an example of if worn by the church, patience, this new community will have a different type of relationship between those in that community. He says, bearing with one another. In the new community, will there be complaints? In the church, are there complaints? I suppose being an elder for a few months, yes, there are. I've found incredible joys, but also I've found complaints, sometimes even about the most innocuous of things, sometimes about the most serious of things. But are we bearing with one another, not burdening one another, afflicting one another? You see, an unaddressed complaint can and will result in a more serious effect. Before, my example on patience was a simple example, but serious. This can and will extend itself to more serious relationship issues. The breakdown of relationship all the way up to things like divorce. Psychologists have established the common signs and stages within, divo within divorce. Where first there begins criticism. And criticism leads to complaint. Which then brings conflict. And then conflict finally breeds contempt. And they would say these are common in most divorces or separations. And I would say common in the breakdown of all relationship. But a new community that wears the virtues of Christ will and can bear with one another. He goes on to say they will administer the antidote to accusation before it becomes contempt he says this he says forgiving one another bearing with one another if one has complaint against another forgive each other as the lord has forgiven you so you must also so you also must forgive do you keep a record of wrong do you accuse do you complain but can see in the same breath, Jesus has forgiven me. In the light of what the Lord has done to forgive you. But you won't forgive your brother or your sister. This is not to be flippant with forgiveness. Because some of you will respond, forgive. You don't know what they did. Forgiveness and beyond forgiveness. This is perhaps because you misunderstand forgiveness. Forgiveness is not about retaining instant trust or instant reconciliation or a return to an old relationship. It is the first step in which there is freedom from torment, guilt, shame, anger, rage. And it is not instantaneous neither. It's not one-off neither. As Jesus tells his followers, when someone has wronged you, forgive them 70 times 7. Continue to forgive. The world does not act like this. It's an eye for an eye. Vengeance, retaliation. 
When was the last time you read a social media post where someone forgave someone else? It doesn't happen. Or perhaps a politician or a celebrity came forth and asked for forgiveness or gave forgiveness. It doesn't happen. In the new community, there's a supernatural change here where something different occurs. That the church of the Lord here doesn't hold grudges. Bear with the bears with one each one another, forgiving one another, as Jesus has forgiven us. My prayer this morning is for you, as you sit there, is that you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and experience his forgiveness so that you can be healed from sin that has been done to you and sin that you have done to others. And once this has happened, we can do the next thing that Paul writes in the verses. He says this, he says, and above all these, put on love. This is the fundamental underpinning of our relationship with Christ. Jesus motivated through love. You see, the world's relationships are completely different. Completely different. They're bound together in need. You do this for me, I will do that for you. You sustain me, look after me, I will sustain, I will look after you. We have kids together, so that binds us together. Our relationship is about them. I have emotional needs which you fulfill. I need something. And this results essentially in us using each other. Using each other. What can I get from them? What use are they to me? Until something better comes along, perhaps, and we can ditch that relationship and move on to the next. Jesus does not love like this. Of what use are we to him? None. But yeah, he loves us anyway. And dies for the ungodly, the Bible says. In the new community, in the new church, love allows us to stop using one another. Start loving one another. Love binds it all together in harmony. Okay. By this point, I can assume some of you are thinking, okay, aye, this is all good. But it doesn't play out like this in the real world. If we were to take this to reality, sinfully you are missing the point. The real world you think upon is not the reality that Christ wants to create. It is not the place in which he wants to build. It is why in this place we preach Christ is all and in all. We come full circle back to the first portion of the verse. The new community is the new reality that the Lord Jesus is creating in the hearts of those who believe and follow him. He knows, he knows we are not the finished article. This is why he writes, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in in one body. Simply put, let Jesus be the ref. And when there's criticism or complaint, we take it to Christ in prayer, in which we will allow to rule in our hearts. And as we close this morning in this new community, I ask us to do one final thing in our verses this morning. He says, and be thankful. Are you critical or thankful? Are you a grumbler? You know, some of us uh, are expert archeologists when it comes to grumbling, aren't we? We love to dig up the past. The new community is thankful for God, for Jesus, for each other, for its leaders, for its elderly, for its children, for all of its brothers and sisters. I know this. I'm thankful. I'm thankful to God for this body, this church, Westwood Hill. So then why emphasize this topic? Why bring this message if not to answer the first question? What are we doing here? 
I know the elders and I have been praying, discussing this very question, which is right and proper in various forms. What are we doing here? It's something that's preoccupied my thoughts for months now, ever since we joined together to celebrate 40 years of this church here in East Kilbride. And the stark truth is this, that we don't know the effect that this letter had on the church in Colossae. Did it survive after this? Or did they just give up? Did they read the message and decide that it was too hard? Did they believe the words of Christ, the ones that were written to them, that he was all and in all? Will we? Will we as a new community? Not without embracing the single truth, not half, not quarter, but fully, that Christ is all and in all. And we must, and we must, for the gospel to be preached in this town, we must. I'm not sure if you noticed, this week in East Kilbride, there was a story in the UK News, if you get the UK News, pound 30, good paper. I'm going to read this to you. Because we are thankful to the past, but we're also cautious of the past. And the lessons it can teach to us. The headline reads, End of an era is church to be replaced by flats. By flats. The proposals to turn the abandoned threshold church into a block of 11 two-bedroom flats were approved by the South Lancashire Council's planning committee. And for those who don't follow, threshold was the parent church to this one. A church plant born out of that once vibrant church, which had to recently close its doors, will soon be replaced with flats. And we are thankful to the past, to those who had that vision to do that elsewhere in this town. Otherwise, this wouldn't be here. You wouldn't sit here. Thankful and grateful. And here's some quotes that stood out in the article uh, direct to me. East Mains Community Council Chil Chair Bill Arthur admits he will be sad to see the old church disappear but was glad the land was being used. Over the years, the church used to have a great number in the congregation but it started to go down over the years. The project can make use of the space. East Kilbride Central North Independent Councillor Sheena Wardo, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, was happy to see more housing units in the town. We do need more housing in East Kilbride, and if it's going to be affordable, then I would welcome it. An SNP councillor for the area, Hugh McDonald, said, hopefully the noise disruption during the construction will be kept to a minimum for the residents. So then the question is this, as we finish, is it more important that our town has homes or new communities? New communities made up of the one that we have read this morning. One that is adopted into the royal family of God. Who are loved and are willing to share and to serve the community. Having compassionate hearts. Willing to spend everything in order to share kindness. Serving one another in humility. A community tough for each other but tender with each other. One that is willing to patiently bear with one another. Forgive any complaint or criticism or conflict or contempt. A community that is bound together in love every day and is known in this town for that love. That will declare, a community that will declare from their mouths, rain, let rain in their hearts and govern the work of their hands this simple statement. Christ is all and in all. Amen. Let us pray as we close our service this morning. Father God, we come before you as broken and sinful people 
knowing that only through your Son, Jesus Christ, can we be restored and repaired. And in doing so, you draw us with that new self to a new community, one where love binds us together. A prayer this morning, Father, is that Westwood Hill in the town of East Kilbride is that new community. That the people in that community wear proudly on their hearts, declare before all others that Christ is all and in all. And we know, Father, we cannot do this on our own steam. And by your Spirit's power, speak to us this morning to change, repent, go to each other where one has complained against the other and ask for forgiveness or offer forgiveness. By your Spirit's power, Father, heal those within our body so that we can go from this place and begin the work that you have set before us to spread and build this new community in this world, in this town. In Jesus' name, amen.